the National Farmers Organization presents Midwest Farm Report. The NFO presents Rural Renewal with today's special guest, Pastor Alvin P. Brucklocker, who is now serving the Florence Rural Lutheran Parish of the American Lutheran Church. Pastor Brucklocker has a deep interest in rural America and its survival, and he addresses himself to farmers, small-town businessmen, and professional people in urging them to unite in the spirit of Christ to solve our present problems. Here now is Pastor Brucklocker. Hello, folks. I would like to talk with you today about a problem which concerns all of us. That problem is the loss of our farm people, which stems basically from a loss of farm income. Not too long ago, I read a portion of a book entitled God's Back Pasture. This book was written by a minister by the name of Arthur Wentworth Hewitt, in which he made a statement, and I should like to quote it. All throughout the countryside with which I am acquainted, the farmer is at a disadvantage. He is the atlas of all labor, and it is he on whose shoulders the world is carried. If we get down to stark primitive needs, he is the only indispensable man, for he feeds all physical hunger and stands between the human race and death. Why then is this bitter thing, that he should have to struggle with debt and mortgage all his life and be forever clamped in the vice of markets which he can neither control nor influence. For just as some blessed cooperative action seeks to strike off these shackles, a new and unforeseen factor arises with heavy chains and rivets aplenty. The weariness and the disheartenment of death are upon him. For the man who does the work which God gave to him and blessed in Eden is now amongst the last for economic justice to find. And so long as this is true, the rural church will be relatively poor. My friends, I would like to talk to you as one who speaks out of an experience with that poverty. The poverty, first of all, I would like to point out is not one of economic poverty. Although this is at the root of the problem, the poverty is one of people and leadership. We should never forget this one thing about agriculture, and that is that the main product of agriculture is people. But today, Many of the people in agriculture are suffering from a loss of morale and are making statements like this. There is no future in farming. Farming is a, gam a gamble and other such statements. And there is, on the part of many, a general attitude of give up itis and throwing in the towel and saying that there is nothing that we can do. Now we should all realize that the average age of the farmer is 59 years old. This means that in another five to 10 years, where will our farmers be coming from? Because a lot of these same people are saying to their sons, there is no future in farming for you. Do something different. We could very well realize if this loss of people continues, we could very well realize a very serious problem unless it is halted. And that is why I would like to speak with you today because I believe that there are several things that we can do. 
but we must understand that we are all a part of it. The businessman in a small town who thinks that he is not affected by this problem will need also to realize that when the farmer loses a dollar of his income, he will be one of the first one to suffer from it. For every dollar that the farmer makes in 100% of parity, our nation in all of its segments of economy will profit seven times over. Whenever he suffers a loss, anything less than 100% of parity, our economy too will suffer that loss. We must remember that we can never replace earned income with credit. And that man who turns over the raw materials from the soil must be rewarded. Now there are many solutions being offered today. For example, in 1963, the Committee on Economic Development made a study and came up with an adaptive solution to agriculture. And the solution was to dismiss two and one half million people from the farm. This began in 1963 and it has been progressing according to that standard. Today we hear from our Department of Agriculture that the solution to this problem of inflation, inflation which stems basically from the loss of farm income, tracing it all the way back to our raw materials and resources, that the solution here is lower farm prices. It is also put forth quite a bit that the solution will be in Congress or in legislation. We will need a lot of assistance here, but the ultimate solution cannot come from legislation. It can only assist. We also hear that the answer and the solution to what is happening in agriculture today is bigger farms. But yet there is one thing forgotten here, and that is for economic reasons. We may go to big farming and forget that the major product of agriculture is people. So I would like to say that the area in which the solution lies will be one of prevention. We have heard so much about adaptation and adjustment. We've got to face the trends and we've got to, uh, to accept the changes. And yet for these last hundred years, since the beginning of the Department of Agriculture in our United States government, we have not had a total solution. We have received help, yes, but the problem has not been answered in total. We must turn to attacking the causes with prevention instead of attacking the symptoms with cure. And I would like to say that there are basically three areas in which the problem can be solved. And it must be solved by the people who feel the need and the concern in the rank and file of the farmer and agriculture, including the small town businessmen and all of the people at first directly related to the farmer. And in the first area will be one of realizing and understanding the disadvantage of the farmer. Now we will all agree at this point that the farmer has never had it so good. He's never had so many advantages. This can be true in production but not in marketing. The farmer has made great strides and agriculture has made great strides in production. And yet, there is a statement that is still being said. Farming is a gamble. Why is this statement being made? I believe that the origin of this statement is not in the area of production but in the area of marketing. A farmer through the history has learned to wrestle with the elements 
He has learned to live through hail. And he can take out hail insurance to safeguard here. If there's any disease upon the face of the earth, he can get medical care for his livestock. If the soil lacks fertility, he can find it through fertilizer. There are many ways in which the farmer can take the risk and the gamble out, if it was ever there. So I do not believe that the, the gamble, as it is so called, is in production and on the inside of the fence line of the farmer. The problems which the farmer faces are on the outside of his fence line. And to move into these areas, he will need the help of his neighbor. And he will need to turn from his success as an independent individual person in farming and work together collectively with his neighbor in marketing. Now, God has promised the farmer a living as well as all other labors. In Genesis 8, verse 22, we read, Seed time and harvest shall not cease. God has promised man a living from the soil, but his neighbor and his fellow men have not. This is the point. And we hear this oftentimes, even Christian thinking people will say that we ought to be content and satisfied. I say yes. We need to learn contentment with what God has given us. But we must not always be satisfied with what man gives. And this is the point. It is not so much that farming is a gamble, but that farmers are gambling and will continue to do so as long as they move that production of theirs, God's blessings, from the inside of the fence line to the outside of the fence line into the area of marketing as individuals. This will take unity. And as man has learned to work as an individual, he will need to learn to work together with his neighbor. The second area in which the solution lies is in realizing the fallacy and the belief which is being said a lot today, and that is that the farmer can be dismissed with or the dispensability of the farmer. A recent statement has been said about the only lesson that man has learned from history is that man has not learned the lessons of history. And I think this is true with the American farmer. We are in the 33rd civilization of the world. 32 other civilizations before us have fallen and gone into decline. Basically, I believe, is evident and traceable in history because of the dismissing of that indispensable link from the soil to the superstructure of any nation. The workers on the soil are an indispensable link. We need a certain amount and a proper proportion of our people on the soil. Take, for example, now, in ancient Greece, only about one-fifth of their land was tillable. But ancient Greece was able to survive the devastations of time for quite a while because the land was in the hands of many people. I would say when we begin to think that corporation farming today is going to be the type of farming of the future, we ought to consider the dangers of such a move. In the first place, the danger of moving the land from many to the hands of a few. Secondly, we ought also to consider the danger of an impersonal agriculture, where there are fewer and fewer owners and more and more workers who do not own the soil upon which they live and their farm. Now, this is what happened in Rome. First of all, those who owned the land moved to the cities. They had people hired to take care of the land. After a while, 
They lost concern. They cared nothing for the soil. It was brought to ruin. They too had to move into the city. And what did they do? They added to the unemployment lines. And in the last part of the Roman Empire, they lived off of imports from other nations. A nation was brought to ruin because farming was brought to a ruin basically when the people were dismissed from the land. Now in the Bible, the book of Isaiah chapter 5 verse 8, we are warned of this. Woe unto you who add house to house and join field to field until you only are left to dwell alone in the midst of the land. What does this mean? Increasing larger and larger farms and adding more and more houses in urban dwelling. William Jennings Bryan said, burn your cities and your farms will continue to prosper, but burn your farms. Or in other words, dismiss your farms and the farm population and grass will grow in your city streets. It is important for us to realize when we are told so much about the concern of economic efficiency in production and the corporation's concern for a profit that we must never forget there must also be efficiency in the social life of people who live in this world and on God's earth. We must be just as much concerned about the people who live in the soil as the production of food and fiber from that soil. We must never forget that man was first taken from the soil and finds his subsistence in a close identity to that soil. Now in the third instance, the third area which I believe the solution lies is an understanding of disparity. Disparity is the opposite of parity. Parity, as far as we can understand, means the just rewards for the man who works in bringing God's blessings from the soil and given in service to others. Our Lord Jesus Christ in the 10th chapter of St. Luke, verse 7, said this, a laborer is worthy of his hire. Now who did he mean? Did he mean only the disciples who were first called to follow him? Or did he mean all people who labor and all people who work, whether they be on the farm in, or in factory or any other occupation and place of vocation. In a hymn book, which I have, which we use in our church, we have a prayer. God grant them the just rewards for their labors. Now this has great meaning to me. There's one thing that I cannot quite understand, and that is how many people today can sit down to a good square meal and pray, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let this food to us be blessed, and then say amen, and partake of that food and yet forget or not realize that there were people who made it possible for this food to be on that table. And many of these people who were laborers were not given a fair price for those blessings. It has led me into an area of deep concern and what I call a total understanding of stewardship. To me, before I as a minister can speak about stewardship in the use 
of a man's money from his pocketbook to the offering plate. I must first of all understand the Aryan speak about stewardship in the income that he never received. We talk so much about stewardship. That is, a man should use rightly what he receives from God. That is true. But today we are even living in a world, and in the world of agriculture, where marketing is essential for a man's livelihood. Now the past history of the farmer reveals that he has never been able to sufficiently organize himself to be able to take these blessings and say, this is what I must have for this production. Instead, the history of agriculture has been one where the farmer has taken these blessings that have come from the earth and put them on the market as individuals and has asked, what can you give me? Here again, I believe the distinction and the understanding must be considered. And that is in the area of stewardship. To me, it should be the concern of all ministers, of people who call themselves Christian, and of our whole church, especially in the field of agriculture, whether it be in South Dakota, North Dakota, in Iowa, Minnesota, Nebraska, or any other state in the Midwest and in our nation, that if the farmer is not receiving a fair price for that production, we ought to encourage our people in agriculture to take steps to do something about it. Now, I do not believe that this is going to be answered uh, from outside the rank and file of, of people in agriculture. I know that there are many who believe this today, but I, I firmly believe that it is the people who are basically involved in this loss today who are going to have to come to the solution to this problem and come to it together. Now there is an understanding any place in which we as ministers and, and Christian people, lay people, in our church can help. And that is, we ought to encourage our farm people to explore and to, ins and to study the history of the farm organizations over these last hundred years. I know that a lot of people have given up and, and, and have said that uh, the farm organizations have never helped the farmer, but here again we've got to understand that it takes a lot of time sometimes for people to grow together in understanding. Sometimes this can become a long, complex, and involved process, but I don't think that the hundred-year history of the agrarian movement and the farm organizations has been for nothing. I believe that it has been moving toward a fulfillment, toward a goal. And it has been true that maybe the solution uh, has not been, has not been uh, uh, offered or or been such that it could make a difference. But we cannot let go of all of this work and effort with the concerns and the heartaches of people down through the ages of history and especially in these last hundred years in America. Today, a new farm organization has come on the scene within the last 10 to 15 years, called the National Farmers Organization. There is one thing that we must all understand, 
and that is the principle of collective bargaining. If we will study the Constitution of the United States, we will see that it is inbuilt and written in the Constitution, the right to bargain for goods and services in a free market. In 1922, the farmer received the right to bargain in this manner. Take a look at the creed of the future farmers of America, and you will see it stated there concerning more power in bargaining. 90% or over 90% of the segments of an economy in our nation use collective bargaining in some manner, way or another. We must understand the principle, which is basically people working together, who should be working together in love to solve a common problem. And here I would say, to me, the biggest area of solution today is if the farm organizations can get together around a table and start to talk things out. To me and to many others, it becomes understandable that there should be more things that the farmers and the farm organizations have in common than not. And it's going to take a while to talk over these differences. But a, a federation of the farm organizations, at least a way in which they can all work together, sit down around a table and talk things out. For I say, what do the farmers and the farm organizations have more in common than the production and a price for that production? And we must come to an understanding, I believe, today, as Abraham Lincoln said, that if this nation will not perish, it will take a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. But today we have many people who want to look to a government to solve their problems for them and to do things for them. We cannot have a government for the people until we have a government of the people and by the people. And this means that every last person in agriculture, together with his fellow man and his neighbor, has a great potential and stands on the threshold of a new era in agriculture if he will unite in the spirit of love and Jesus Christ. This does not come easy. But I feel as a minister that I must continue to urge the farmers and the farm organizations uh, to unite and to find some way, whatever policy it may be, to solve this problem from within and amongst the people in agriculture today. Because we are all depending upon what happens in the farm problem today by those who live in agriculture. <laughs> The Midwest Farm Report was brought to you by the National Farmers Organization. The NFO, with the interest of rural America and its survival, has brought you Rural Renewal with Pastor Alvin P. Brocklocker of the Florence Rural Lutheran Parish of the American Lutheran Church. For more information on the NFO, attend meetings in your area or contact the National Farmers Organization, Corning, Iowa. Family Farm Agriculture, the grassroots of America.